Good afternoon and welcome to another PAHO Live Conversation. Today, we'll be discussing the topic of childhood cancer in the Caribbean and Latin America. I'm Shanique from the PAHO Communications team, and I will be your host today. A huge thank you to our viewers joining on our PAHO Caribbean Facebook and Twitter pages. We're absolutely pleased to have you with us. So let's begin with some background. September is internationally observed as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. In our region, 29,000 children are diagnosed with cancer each year. It is therefore essential that we raise awareness about childhood cancer and offer support to children and adolescents living with cancer, the brave survivors, and their families. We have an amazing group of panelists with us. They are Dr. Liliane Vasquez, a PAHO WHO Childhood Cancer Consultant. Hello, Dr. Vasquez. We have Dr. Karina Ribeiro. She is also a PAHO WHO Childhood Cancer Consultant. Hello, Dr. Ribeiro. We have Dr. Swad Fuentes Alabi, who is an APAHO WHO Childhood Cancer Consultant. And we have Dr. Kurt Bodkin. He is a pediatric oncologist at the Wendy Fitzwilliam Pediatric Hospital in Trinidad and Tobago. So we have an activity pack session with these amazing panelists. What we can promise is an interesting conversation about childhood cancer in the Americas, specifically addressing how the COVID pandemic has impacted the care of children with cancer, the solutions and alternatives that both professionals and societies are implementing to mitigate it. And we'll talk a bit about early diagnosis. What is critical to achieving improved survival in children who develop childhood cancer? So let's get started. The first question goes to Dr. Ribeiro. How many children are affected by childhood cancer in our region? And what are the main types of cancer? Thank you, Shaniek, and hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. So you mentioned already, so we have 29,000 cases, new cancer cases among children and adolescents in Latin America and Caribbean. And this corresponds to 10% of all cancer cases in this age group in the world. And uh, we have uh, around 10,000 deaths due to childhood cancer in the region every year, which corresponds to 9% of all childhood cancer deaths in the world. Uh, the main cancer types are leukemias in our region, like corresponding to 31% of all cases, followed by lymphomas with, with almost 14% of all cases, and then the central nervous system or brain tumors corresponding to 11% of the cases. So also it's important to emphasize that in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, cancer today is the main cause of death by disease, surpassed only by accidents and violence in the age group of children and adolescents from one year of age to 19 years of age. So it's a very important public health problem, and that's why we are here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ribeiro. Dr. Botkin, so we've received a snapshot of childhood cancers in the region and the main types of cancers. But I'd like you to tell us what are the main challenges in treating children with cancer in the Caribbean, particularly in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, thank you very much, Shanika. Um, it's a pleasure being part of this panel to share some of our thoughts on childhood cancer. Um, in the Caribbean region, I think um, we face two major challenges in terms of improving outcomes for children with cancer. The first is actually the diagnostic aspect. So the child comes in with the symptoms, you think it's, it's cancer, 
And now um, what we know for internationally is that this phase is the most important step in terms of directing the appropriate treatment. So we want an accurate as well as a timely diagnosis. Part of the challenge in, in the Caribbean region is having those specialties which can help you sort of give you that more detailed about the diagnosis. For instance, Dr. Ribeiro um, mentioned um, one of the commonest cancers, leukemia. In the past, what we would do is we would take the blood, we would look at it under the microscope and we would decide what it was. Um, now things are much more specialized in terms of improving the outcome for these children, where you require very specialized tests. One of them, it's a very fancy name, but it's called a flow cytometry, which types the cells exactly rather than someone looking at sort of how the cells are shaped and making that decision. And then what we know um, for directing treatment for children with cancer, the commonest type, as we, we've just said, is also knowing what is the genetic makeup of those abnormal cells. So you find within the Caribbean region, we don't readily have access to those um, tests, specialized tests. And for instance, in Trinidad and Tobago, thankfully through international partnerships, we can send those tests off and actually um, get a firm diagnosis. And that is very similar to some of the other cancers that Dr. Ribeiro mentioned, which was lymphomas. And some of, even now, um, as, as people would know, a lot of specialists would know, um, even for the brain tumors, this is becoming a very important step in diagnosis. So the timely and accurate diagnosis is one of the challenges we face. Um, the second major challenge, I would say, having now known exactly what type of cancer it is, you must direct the treatment towards that cancer to give the best outcome for the children. And sometimes the drugs may not be available, or sometimes you may have what we call stockouts, meaning that sometimes the drug is available, but at times you are ready to use it, it's not available. Um, and that then poses a second challenge in terms of, we talked about a timely diagnosis and timely treatment is also equally as important. So I would say those are the two major challenges we see in the Caribbean and region and certainly in Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Botkin. That information was extremely informative and it has put us in a great position to go over to Dr. Vasquez, Dr. Vasquez. And Dr. Vasquez, the question for you then is, COVID-19 has greatly impacted health services. How has it impacted the delivery of services to patients requiring pediatric care? Thank you so much, Toniek. And, and I think this conversation is very important because as Karina and, and Kurt was we're mentioning childhood cancer is, is a public health priority. And, and it's very, very, very interesting how the COVID pandemic also affected mo many of the pediatric oncology service in the region. Um, I think it is something known that not only for cancer, but for other types of diseases, hypertension, diabetes, many of the treatment were disrupted during the pandemic. And, specifically for, for pediatric cancer, we did a, an interesting report last year, and we're planning to do another one uh, and to publish uh, some data this year too, about how these, um, these disruptions of the treatment, let's say chemotherapy, radiotherapy, bone marrow transplantation, surveillance for the patients were disrupted during the, during the pandemic, specifically for during this month uh, of the early phase of the pandemic, uh, in last in, in, during the last year, April, June, uh, July, where most many of the countries in, in the region had this first peak, the first wave of the pandemic, and and we we reported that to uh, thirty to eighty percent of the of the treatments were partially or totally disrupted uh, in, in the hospitals. And that was something that indeed could affect the outcome of many children. Fortunately, this situation has changed. We can see that now since October, November of last year, and, and during this year, many of the treatments were normalized. 
even when many of the cases were more uh, hype and 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 we can see the the effect of the pandemic in, in many in many countries with high number of, of cases and that's but I think the vaccination of, of the physicians and the normalization of the treatments were, were very important to, to recover these this, this services. And, and something that was interesting too in, in a report is that not only was bad, but also this pandemic brought some important opportunities to the services to, to improve. For example, the telemedicine uh, in which uh, from nearly half of the centers that we uh, analyzed did not have a telemedicine service at the beginning, but after the pandemic, up to 80% of the services actually increased the use of these important tools to, to, to treat the children. And as Kurt was mentioning also, this, has, uh, this is a, a big challenge to to, to provide the diagnostic services that are more specialized uh, over the time to, to, to treat uh, these kids. That's something that it's important. And finally, um, something that also we observed during this, this first year of the pandemic was that the effect of the pandemic was even worse in the countries that, high, that have this um, low, expenditure in health, right? Uh, for example, countries like Uruguay, like Chile, like Costa Rica that have a high income uh, could manage a little bit better the response to the pandemic in the pediatric oncology services uh, when it was compared to other countries. So definitely the investments that the countries and the governments can do in health will reflect also what they can do for cancer in general, but specifically for pediatric cancer, as it's highly, highly curable, it's very important. Very good information, Dr. Vasquez. And viewers, if you're joining us on our PAHO, Caribbean, Facebook, and Twitter pages, you have joined us in the middle of an interesting live conversation on childhood cancer. We just heard from Dr. Vasquez, who spoke about how COVID-19 impacted the delivery of pediatric care to children with cancer. We... Well, I have to say that the points that she raised were absolutely eye-opening, and it made me wonder how our healthcare professionals across the region have been adapting. And for that, I'd love Dr. Fuentes to lean in a bit and tell us how health professionals and services adapted to this new reality. Thank you so much, Shaniak. Um, as Liliana mentioned it. Uh, one of the main uh, impacts was the disruption in, in treatment for child, children with cancers and in a way to avoid the outbreak for, for, for COVID-19 outbreak that forced pediatric oncology units to alter their basic oper operationality to minimize the risk of the virus spreading, the minimizing the risk to uh, have delayed in treatment delivery, while uh, they try to provide the best possible management and, and also to isolate the cases found positive for COVID and above all to ensure that children and adolescents are able to access to their oncology treatment. In response to these challenges, uh, countries have implemented new policies, have distributed resources, um, changed their, uh, their type of uh, providing care. Hospital were inclined to decrease the need for hospital visits when patients have a high risk of death due to SARS-CoV-2 infection. And one of the countries uh, like El Salvador, the National Pediatric Cancer Program team recognized the importance of expanding telemedicine to optimize care through video calls. The healthcare system affected by the lockdown imposed a fear and forced patients at the, and the medical team to embrace telemedicine. Telemedicine uh, was attempted to safeguard resources in the oncology program by seeing follow-up patients through, through it, 
while the medical team optimized the care to their newly diagnosed patients or those patients that were under active treatment. Uh, by mid-April, the traveling restrictions became more severe, uh, forcing patients also to stay at home. This uh, also uh, influenced and affected that eventually by September, the team provided care uh, through telemedicine, not only at the follow-up patients, to the follow-up patients, uh, but also many patients in active treatment start receiving their post-chemotherapy laboratory evaluation results by telephone, by Zoom, or by WhatsApp. Different pediatric oncology units have also reported implementing physical distancing measures, reorganizing the staff in 12-hour shift per group, or sending non-essential personnel to do telework to reduce exposure. One of those uh, countries were Guatemala, they, they split uh, in two group, the, the shift of the medical team. So to avoid the exposure uh, simultaneously uh, of, of the complete uh, team. So they were covering one week, uh, group, group A and group B covered the, the following week. In that regard, they were able to optimize care for all children with cancer and all adolescents with cancer, reducing the exposure of families and the patients. Thank you, Dr. Fuentes. That information is really great because it just showed how we've had to pivot, not just in a country, but as a health system in general and also health professionals. So that information is extremely encouraging and the fact that we were able to do that and are in a better position now. So we've discussed a bit about the situation in our region, how we've pivoted, and I believe it's time to change gears and focus a bit on the World Health Organization's global initiative against childhood cancer. Dr. Vasquez, please tell us about the WHO's global initiative against childhood cancer and the work that is being done. Thank you so much for, for the question. Well, the Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer is an effort of everyone, basically. Um, since 2018, it was launched by the World Health Organization uh, in an effort to reduce the, the, the mortality related to childhood cancer in the world. And the main objective is to reach at least 60% of survival in children with cancer. It's a very ambitious objective because Currently, we know that in countries with um, low and, and medium income, um, they, they probably would have to from 20 to 30% of survival. So this increase in the survival will be engaged with some specific activities that we can provide and help with the countries and provide some technical assistance with them, for them uh, to, to reach this goal. And, from the PAHO perspective in the region of the Americas, of course, we have a big challenges. I think Kurt and Karina and Swat have already mentioned some, some of them related to the diagnosis, the treatment, to the abandonment of treatment, and specifically to the late uh, staging of the, of the childhood cancer in a region, the, the lack of uh, high quality registries in, in some countries, and many other problems that are important to, to address to solve this problem. So PAHO is doing a, a tremendous amount of work uh, within this framework of the Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer uh, to try to, to provide this, to, to help the, the, the governments and the, and the member states to, to reach this goal. And so far since 2019, when it was launched in the region, Peru was the first country that, uh, that started with this initiative. Uh, in Peru, we had a lot of great accomplishments and, and progress, as such as the, the launch of the Childhood Cancer Law and the, the, the start of some financial protection for the families, the reducement of the abandonment of treatment, the development of several projects, quality and, and communicational, educational projects for the country. So it has been a tremendous work and also progresses in, in a country that has 
uh, high mortality for childhood cancer. And now we're working with 11 countries in the region, in South America and Central America and the Caribbean, trying to provide this uh, technical assistance to, to, to our colleagues and to the governments to, to help with this mission. And, and also uh, as, as, as a main objective, it's important that we are trying to work with several experts and, 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 and professionals from the region to with, um, with, uh, within this uh, framework of uh, some regional working groups for psychosocial, for nursing, for nutrition, not only for the medical uh, professionals, but also for all the medical team that brings uh, the attention of these children. So I think, I think this, has, this is a great um, opportunity for, for, for uh, our countries to improve and to finally, I think, um, improve the outcomes for these children. This is something that we have very clear and we want to, to promote and, and make a great dissemination of all the efforts and opportunities that we're trying to, to accomplish with these countries. That's such a wonderful overview. I was here listening and I love the fact that it's a big audacious goal that we're working towards. And it's something that's reliant on all of us working together to make a difference for the young people and their young lives. So this initiative is it's just truly uh, inspirational, it's going to be impactful and it's needed now. You mentioned a little bit about what the countries were doing, and I'd love to hear a bit more about that. And so, Dr. Ribeiro, I want uh, you to answer what are the main highlights of this global initiative in Brazil, and what do you hope to achieve there? Thank you, Shaniak. Uh, it, it, it's a pleasure to talk about the, the progress we are making in Brazil. So Brazil has uh, decided initially to join the initiative at the beginning of this, this year. And uh, in this process of like uh, adding more countries like uh, Liliana mentioned it. And then we have partnered with the Ministry of Health, uh, with the Brazilian Society of Pediatric Oncology, with the St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, uh, PAHO, uh, Brazilian office and PAHO headquarters, uh, and also with uh, many uh, partners from the civil society. Uh, they are very important in the, this, this process. So all the stakeholders, we are working, we have like uh, meetings and we are planning initiatives. And the main point I want to uh, touch base is the thing about like uh, the disparities, like uh, Liliana mentioned it, the disparities in survival that are worldwide and even in, the, in only one country, they are present in the country. So the results that we observe today in the North, in the Amazon region and the Northeast of the country in Brazil are completely different from the results observed in the more economically developed regions in the country, the South and the Southeast. So what we wanna do is to plan activities, interventions that are more needed in each region in, in a way that we make the, the country more homogeneous, reaching a good uh, survival rate for, for our children and adolescents. So we have been working uh, uh, about like early diagnosis. There is a course on uh, uh, PAHO, uh, the public health uh, virtual campus on um, early diagnosis that is being translated to Portuguese. Uh, we are working in things related to the cancer registries. We also had a very good discussion with the Minister of Health in order to uh, discuss and standardize the criteria because we have a public health system. So the health care for children with cancer in Brazil is absolutely free for all, which is very good. But uh, there is a way to classify the centers and we want to guarantee that all children, they are receiving treatment, diagnosis and treatment in the reference centers, all of them. So we are working in close relationship with uh, the Ministry of Health and all these partners. 
So we are, and the main goal is to offer the best and to, it doesn't matter if a child in Brazil is, was born in the Amazon or if was born in Sao Paulo where I live, they all get the same quality of treatment diagnosis and have the same chance of, of curing the, 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 the cancer that, that this, the she or he had diagnosed with. So that's such a fantastic ambition and goal because the it will make a difference the type of treatment received and it should be the same across the board regardless of whether you are in the Amazon or if you are in a big city. I am pleased that Brazil has presented this example of progress through the involvement of the private and public sector stakeholders, because normally together we really can achieve so much more. And because we're dealing with such a powerful topic and something that impacts the lives of the next generation, I see no better area to be collaborating on to this extent. So that's absolutely awesome, Dr. Ribeiro. I was really pleased when you shared just now. Dr. Botkin, what I would love right now is to hear about the main achievements of treating children with cancer in the Caribbean, particularly in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think one of the goals you heard Liliana talk about is achieving a better overall survival for these children. Um, as you know, um, internationally, um, children with cancer, the outcome for these children, about 80% of these children survive their cancers, or in some institutions, this could be um, as high as 90%. I think one of our uh, main achievements in Trinidad and Tobago has been improving our survival to approximately 65%, but that has not been an easy task. And I think you've heard um, a number of people mention now partnerships. And I think that's one of the most important things in terms of treating children with cancer. Um, we've been fortunate in Trinidad and Tobago be, to be part of an international collaboration with the Hospital for Six Children in Toronto, which is called the Sick Kids Caribbean Initiative for Children with Cancer and Blood Disorders. This initiative started in 2013. And since that initiative started, it, it focused mainly on building capacity within our region, which has been difficult, different to other twinning programs where someone would lend support. This actually looked at building capacity within the region to the extent, for instance, um, prior to an English speaking Caribbean, at least there were only two um, pediatric oncologists, myself and Dr. Corinne Sinqui in the Bahamas. And um, to date, Six Kids has actually trained four additional um, pediatric oncologists. Um, this initiative involves um, six islands, um, Trinidad and Tobago, um, Barbados, Jamaica, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and St. Lucia. Did I get six there? I think I did, yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, it's certainly, it started in 2013 and it certainly made a difference um, to our region. I think another, and through that initiative, we've also had another important international collaboration, and that is with the American Society of Hematology in sort of improving outcomes for children with leukemia. In Trinidad and at, at present, um, that survival rate is as high now as 80%. And what that initiative looked at is actually tailoring um, treatment to the to the, what, is, what is actually available in the country to give the best outcome. And using those expertise within the, the ASH community, sorry, American Society of Hematology, um, um, to sort of lend support to getting that improvement. We can't forget for Trinidad and Tobago, we've been very fortunate as well that the government has actually um, taken this as one of the major priorities. So we have a national cancer, cancer control coordinating committee. It's a, it's a mouthful. We call it the N4C, <laughs> but just for simplicity. And part of that, we've been fortunate enough to have a childhood 
cancer focal group. So that actually helps the government sort of see um, childhood cancer as an important um, issue um, and actually um, do a lot to sort of invest in treatment of children with cancer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Woodkin, for your great response. And I think it's something very, very important how we can help the community to, to reach this goal actually with us because we're a team, community, the parents, professionals, healthcare workers, the government. And for that, I think one of the main, main messages of today is how we can accomplish the early detection of childhood cancer. What can families do and professionals can do to detect these diseases timely? So I don't know, Saad, so if you can elaborate a little bit. Thank you, Liliana. Um, it, that's an important point. Early detection is one of the key elements within the package of QDO, like to create uh, awareness for the Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer uh, from World Health Organization and PAHO. Uh, you know that for to uh, improve childhood cancer outcomes in low middle income countries will require overcoming multiple barriers and as you mentioned uh, those barriers presently uh, compromise care delivery and the impact on the survival and late diagnosis is one of those barriers that uh, affect uh, the, the survival uh, rate at the end and as a modifiable risk factors for childhood cancer are unknown, but efforts to increase timely diagnosis and access to effective treatment are crucial. A lack of both professional and public awareness of the early warning signs and symptoms of childhood cancer is a fundamental barrier, as, I am, as all of you have mentioned in, in most of the regions. Uh, where low middle income countries, this is the main barrier. And an increased awareness of the early warning signs and symptoms would contribute to more timely recognition of childhood cancers, referral to specialized care, diagnosis and treatment initiation. This in return holds the possibility of less advanced dis stage disease and lower disease and treatment related morbidity and mortality. And how we will recognize uh, er, in an early fashion those symptoms. You know, er, er, early in this, this disease, childhood cancer can debut with different and multiple variation of inspecific symptoms. For instance, uh, we have focused in the six more uh, frequent uh, pediatric cancers, we call them, uh, index cancer, like leukemia, that is the most frequent cancer in children, which might cause non-specific symptoms, similar to those of a viral, viral infection. Leukemia should be suspected if there is a persistence of these vague symptoms, are, which are accompanied by uh, evidence of abnormal bleeding, bone pain, um, and this pain is, is so uh, extreme and severe that uh, take the kid to lay down and the, the children doesn't, do, do not uh, show interest of playing or engage in any other activities. It's a, it's a very uh, severe symptom that changes the, the complete behavior in, in, child, in children. Also, it might be joined by lymphadenopathies, which are nodules uh, or little mass in the, which are located in the, in the can be located at, in the neck or axillar area or uh, inguinal area. Also, you can uh, notice enlargement of the abdominal diameter due to enlargement of the liver or the spleen. The presenting symptoms also when you are uh, 
in front of a brain tumor may include elevated um, symptoms that shows uh, increasing depression inside the brain, like uh, vomits, um, abnormalities in the in the motricity, or and or, in, or and that also includes seizures. Uh, for instance, a, a spinal tumor uh, that compromises the spinal cord often presents with signs and symptoms of compression, which uh, consists in numbness of the limbs or the extremity, extremities, or um, also difficulty to walk. Other common uh, childhood cancer is lymphomas, which may be present as one or, or more painless masses, often in the neck or accompanied by signs or symptoms like fever uh, or uh, fever and loss of weight. Uh, uh, another com uh, tumor that is very common is retinoblastoma, which you can detect early since uh, it's generally it presents in the, at the age of average of uh, eight of 22 months. And you can notice with a simple picture of the kid, when you can, when you take the, the picture with the flash, you can see this, the red sign in the eyes. When you have uh, a patient with retinoblastoma, you can notice that the red sign is abolished and you just see uh, uh, the sign of a, the cat eye, like you see as a white spot in the in the eye. And that's a sign that you should consult early with the ophthalmology and the oncology. Another tumor that is common that is in the abdominal location are neuroblastoma and wounds tumor or nephro nephroblastoma, uh, which correspond to um, uh, uh, tumors that affect the nerve and sympathetic nervous systems. It could present in different sites of the body, like for neuroblastoma, could be a abdominal mass that is located in the suprarenal gland, or, a, or it could be located uh, in, in the in thorax, or a, it could also present with skin nodules. And this tumor is presented it can be present since the patient is born. Since the children birth, you can notice the tumors, and and this is very important. There are those tum there are tumors that if you detect it at early age, the prognosis is better than uh, than if you detect it or at early age. And the other, as I, I was mentioning, is the renal. Kid, uh, the kidney tumor that is called nephroblastoma, that it could be accompanied by uh, bleeding in the urine, uh, which is red urine uh, due to bleeding of the renal structures, or abdominal pain or uh, enlargement of the abdomen diameter. The, pre the presentation will de of the different tumors will depend on the Lo, the local effect of the solid tumors and its metastasis. And uh, it is important also to pay attention to those musculoskeletal systems, which uh, first sometimes are detected when the kids fell down or playing, they break their leg, and those are called uh, pathological fractures. And then you, when you do the x-rays, you can find out the, the presence of a lesion in the bone, at the bone or the musculoskeletal tissue. And also it's important that the personnel uh, in charge of provided care for to children at the first level of healthcare uh, services, recognize that there must be another paraneoplastics, what we call certain syndromes that can uh, debut at the same time with a tumor or are associated to the presence of developing a pediatric cancer, like Down syndrome and another uh, normalities like uh, like uh, alterations in the in the iris of the eye, 
or uh, another syndromes that uh, that the medical health uh, the medical team has to be aware and early detection uh, includes uh, the the importance of the detection of this disease not only at the first level that will be in charge of detecting earlier and and deliver and and do the prefer, ref, referral to the first uh, to the third level of treatment where uh, of healthcare where the special specialized team will provide the final care for the patient the early path of referral to the to the to the main a facility where children will receive treatment is really important. The earlier you detect these symptoms, the earlier you will have a diagnosis, the earlier you will be able to provide care. And sometimes those tumors can be cured only with surgery. You won't require chemotherapy. And, and, and what we want is to expose uh, the, in, a, in a less a manner uh, to the to complications due to intensive care of uh, intensive uh, chemotherapy schemes when you have advanced disease. So I think that this is the importance that we want to prevent the early death in these patients due to toxicity due, due to toxicity related to treatment. That's really great information, Dr. Fuentes Alavi. And it's absolutely true. Early detection is important for childhood cancers, just the way it is for every other type of cancer. If you're joining us, we are having a live conversation about childhood cancer, which is such an important topic, which we are giving some extra attention during Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. We have been getting some comments from our viewers, and we got a big up from Cheryl from Logan on Facebook. So I'll encourage our viewers on Facebook and Twitter to please send your comments. We want to hear from you and also send any questions that you have. As we wind down, I want to give each of our panelists an opportunity to share a few final words, just to lean in on a point that was really important that we want to underline and ensure that anybody who is just logging on is able to get some good information. Dr. Kurt Botkin, I will start with you. Sorry, my light time is an unmuting there. Um, so I think um, treatment of childhood cancers in the Caribbean remains a challenge. Um, I think the way forward in overcoming these challenges are by creative partnerships, as we've heard um, a lot of people mentioned. And, and these are creative partnerships at the local level with, with NGOs, non-governmental organizations that can help at the regional level in between countries that share the same in the Caribbean, share the same sea space, I should say. And also very important as well, international collaborations, as you've seen that we've been we've benefited from through the Sick Kids Caribbean Initiative. And I really do think um, with creative collaborations, we certainly can continue to improve the outcome for children with cancer within our region. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bodkin. Over to you, Dr. Vasquez. Thank you so much, Shania. And um, I think it's important to remember that childhood cancer is highly curable. I think that's something that we should never forget, that in the world, in the developed world, many, many children can be cured, but we, there are many challenges in our countries that we need to address. And as my colleagues were mentioning, in, we're in this work together. So there are many opportunities that we have to, to improve the situation. So everybody can do something uh, to, for these children with cancer. If you're a parent, if you're part of a community, if you're a healthcare professional in primary care, or specialists, you you can have an opportunity to 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 help these children to 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 have an early detection, a timely 
treatment, and of course, to improve the survival. So I encourage uh, all the community and the participants that are watching this wonderful conversations to, to join the networks of PAHO and to reach the information that it's available for parents, for the general population and, 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 and all the colleagues the, uh, to, to, to have more information about this, these diseases. Uh, so App has made a really wonderful summary of how we can detect them. We have also guidelines in English and Spanish and, and soon in Portuguese and also opportunities for, for education for healthcare workers and that are, are available uh, and not only for physicians, but also for other uh, professionals, nurses, nutritionists, and psychologists. So I encourage all, all the healthcare workers that could uh, reach the, the, the PAHO networks and our website and the links that we will provide in, in, this, uh, in this, uh, this social media channels. To, to learn more about uh, childhood cancer and to help these children that are so much needed. Thank you so much. Well said, Dr. Vasquez, well said. Over to you, Dr. Fuentes Alabi, for your final words. Thank you very much. This has been an excellent uh, intervention and conversation, especially Dr. Botkin, thank you very much for your experience and how uh, the health system is improving to provide care to these vulnerable population, children and adolescents. And I think that uh, the main goal for 2030 is to cure all children everywhere uh, and improve survival rate. And there is a huge uh, chain of uh, stakeholders that are working together uh, as international institutions like PAHO, WHO, uh, the local PAHO offices, the St. Jude Children's Hospitals, and other collaborators that are uh, working to make this uh, dream become true. And I think that uh, I always think that to cure a child with cancer or to cure an adolescent uh, with cancer, it requires a complete village and the community also has to be engaged in helping us to attain this goal. Thank you very much. That is so true, Dr. Fuentes Alabi. Really curing a child with cancer is, is such an important thing, not just for us now and for our families, but for the future of our region and our world. Dr. Rivero, over to you for your final words. Thank you, Shaniek, and thank you everyone for this wonderful panel and this conversation. And then the message I wanna give as a final message is uh, the message of hope. Like Liliana said, childhood cancer is curable and we have many adults in our society today, uh, doctors, singers, dancers, communicators, engineers, pilots, that they are childhood cancer survivors, making our world better. Uh, the other message is the message of collaboration uh, between uh, different professionals, between different stakeholders, and between different regions, and between different countries, uh, and the message of the innovation, and the message of the research which like uh, the points mentioned by Dr. Bodkin that were very important, the way uh, we treat childhood cancer today is different from the way we treat childhood cancer 30 years ago and will be different tomorrow. Uh, and we need to invest on this and we need to make this problem a public health priority. And this, uh, with this, I wanna and highlighting the role of PAHO and WHO uh, and also all the regional and country offices uh, that are engaging all the different stakeholders in this uh, initiative related to childhood cancer, uh, where I do believe so uh, that we're going to have our village uh, and a complete, a complete one. Thank you. 
thank you, Dr. Ribeiro. I have to say that our panelists, they really said it best. Awareness of childhood cancer is such an important topic. And awareness means being aware of the symptoms and taking a, a willingness, taking that active role to bring your child to the pediatrician to, to have a checkup and ensure that they have a fighting chance against child cancer or any other issues that are related. Another point that really came up was the importance of collaboration. I cannot underscore that enough. Collaboration between private and public sector partners, collaboration between countries and between health professionals, because it is, it is, when they say it takes a, a village to raise a child, it also seems that it takes a village to cure childhood cancer. And we have some audacious goals from that WHO Global Childhood Cancer Initiative. And in the region, PAHO has been doing a great deal of work, but that really redounds to what is being done on the local level. And it is the, the great work of the persons on the front line who continue working in this area, continue doing things when, when these are difficult, when they are working through a pandemic and they may have their own challenges. So you, we have to absolutely take a moment to salute you. So before I wrap up, I must also salute the children and adolescents living with cancer because... I can't imagine being a child living through that. And for the ones who have survived, I, I must commend those brave survivors and their families who were their backbone during that difficult time. Because when something is affecting a child, it also impacts the parents, the aunties, the uncles, everybody related to that family unit, friends, even co-workers, because Especially in Jamaica, each time a child, a parent has a child, everybody becomes an auntie or an uncle. So I've had aunties and uncles that were not related to me at all, yet I needed to call them auntie so-and-so and uncle so-and-so. And so it takes a lot. It takes a lot. And so we really had to take the time out to have this important conversation about childhood cancer and also salute the people who live through it, are living through it, and their families. I'm Shani Parks from the PAHO Communications team, and it's been my absolute pleasure to be with you. Please join us next time for another PAHO Live conversation. Have a great rest of day and happy rest of month because we're almost at the end of September. So remember to check out some of our material on social media. You're already watching us on these social media pages. So have a read. We have several links on our Facebook and Twitter pages to get onto the campaign page and be in the know be in the know so thank you very much for joining us and we look forward to having you again